Amen. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Christmas. What a blessed day. That was my kiddo in the front that was not participating. (laughs) But as we all do, that come to the kingdom of God, she gave in. (laughs) She couldn't resist his will. (laughs) So (laughs) praise the Lord. Um, The text will be... um, Speaking from this morning will be in the book of Matthew, chapter 2, and it will be from verses 1 all the way through verse number 12. The text reads like this this morning. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod, the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by our no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem. And said, go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way. And the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream, do not return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your word, Lord. We thank you for the birth of a king, the king of the Jews, Lord the king of this universe, the one who would humble himself and take on the form of a man. We worship you this morning for the greatest gift given to us. And I pray this morning, God, that you would protect your word from any error. We pray that the text, Lord, would speak to us and challenge us. For as we will see, not all are excited, not all will bow down and worship this king. So we pray that in this place today, that all of our hearts would do exactly that, that we would bow. God, I pray that you would be glorified this morning. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, and we exalt his name alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, Merry Christmas to everyone. It's good to be with you in this auditorium, to the members of this body. If you're visiting with us for the first time, there's a welcome center in the back with uh, individuals who are part of our church here that would love to point you in the right directions or answer any questions that you might have concerning um, how we worship and how we do body life here at Southside. But hopefully the most important thing that they're going to tell you is that we exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. And on this day, uh, we welcome everybody who is live streaming, who couldn't be with us. And we just want to say thank you for spending your Christmas with us, with your family, at this morning of worship. See, what a special day Christmas is. Today we look at the celebration of the birth of the king, the king who never had a beginning. We praise the living God today because he sent his one and only son who became flesh and dwelt among us who was the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world through a gruesome death, followed by a resurrection proving that he was the Son of God. 
the God-man, who in order to redeem sinful men, had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people according to Hebrews. Praise God. Therefore, he would have to humble himself and come as a helpless babe who would be raised by imperfect humans. <laughs> Yet he would grow in wisdom and stature. He would be born of a virgin. Luke 1, 32, 35 says, through 35 says, he will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Colossians tells us, all things have been, been created through him and for him. And unlike the world's kings, who when their children are born, and the announcement goes out to the countless cheers of all the people, this king would be born in a manger and announced to lowly shepherds who would be terrified. I'd be right there with them. <laughs> seeing the heavenly host worship the king, to go into the manger and to see the child right there and worship him, to be allowed, what a privilege that would be, and then to go sp tell, spread the news. Emmanuel, God with us, so that he could preach the gospel to the poor, to proclaim release to the captive to bring recovery of the sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. You see, God had to come dwell with sinful people because we could not go to him. So he came to us. One of the saddest moments in scripture and in history is when Adam and Eve were moved away from the garden where they would walk with God. God literally drove man out, meaning Adam was thrust out because of his sin. And as children of Adam, we could not go back to that garden. So God would come to his enemies instead. After the many foretold prophecies in scripture would be fulfilled through Christ's birth, we can now go town on the mountain over the hills, and everywhere, this good news. If you had all your eggs in front of you, this is the basket that you would put them in. Right? This is the one true God, the God of the universe, who came to his own. There are so many more details concerning this great and glorious birth that we, don't, we, wouldn't, we would have a, such a long service if we went into it. Praise the Lord. I know that we would all do it, but it's Christmas, and... We're going home with our families. And so, you see, the true believer in Christ loves this message, this announcement. It's the best birth announcement he or she could hope for. But in all of this great news, we will see that not all will look at the glorious birth of the king with rejoicing. And some will be troubled at the announcement. So this morning, we're going to look at Herod and his response to the birth of Christ. And we're going to look at the Magi and see how they responded to the birth of Christ. And we're going to see how that correlates with how the world treats him today. All right. 
after reading the text, we read that Herod had an extremely different response compared to the Magi. Everybody has a response to this birth announcement or the Christmas season. For some, it's just a story. It makes no sense. Maybe they haven't heard the complete story, just what they see on TV. Some might say, I'm glad that works for you. I'm glad you believe that. Some would say, you'd have to be crazy to believe something like that because it's just a fable like every other part of the holidays. Some might say, this is the time for goodwill to all men, so don't ruin it with your religion and it's doom and gloom raining on my parade. Some might say, you mean to tell me there is nothing I can do to save myself from the wrath of God and this babe can help? Some might say, I love Christmas. I want the Christmas spirit. Give me Rudolph, Santa, Frosty the Nutcracker, the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future, all the decorations you can, but you can keep that baby in the manger where he belongs. For some, it's the saddest time of the year. You might miss your loved ones. When the season starts, Maybe you can't wait until it's over. But for some, this is the greatest news that you could ever hear. This child will break you down because apart from him, there is no hope to be reconciled back to God. Therefore, let us praise this king forevermore. You see, everybody has a response. All of us. And today we'll look at what Herod seen First of all, when he heard about the king. At first, we know one thing, that Herod is not redeemed, or else he would not respond the way that he did. A little bit about Herod is Herod was known as Herod the Great. He was a descendant of Esau, which would have made him an Edomite. Julius Caesar had appointed his father over the region of Judea, One commentator says he was a ruthless fighter, a cunning negotiator, a subtle diplomat. The Romans appreciated the way he subdued opposition and maintained order among the Jewish people. These qualities combined with an intense loyalty to the emperor made him an important figure in the life of Rome and the Jews of Palestine. After Herod became governor of Galilee, he quickly established himself in the entire region. For 33 years, he remained a loyal friend and ally of Rome. He was appointed as king of Judea, where he was in direct control of the Jewish people. This required careful diplomacy because he was always suspect by the Jews as an outsider and thus a threat to their national right to rule. Herod was a ruthless man. If you were a threat to his kingdom, then murder was not out of the question, as we will see. Herod had his, one of his wives and their two boys put to death. Ruthless man. And of Herod, it was said it was better to be Herod's pig than to be his son. Overall, he did not have the right to the Jewish throne. And the Jews knew this. Therefore, he knew he was on borrowed time. To have anyone other than their own would be worth a revolt. So the first thing that we see in verse number three, where it says, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. The first thing we see is that Herod was troubled at the announcement of the king. See, the question that the Magi asked caused even more uncertainty of his position than he already had because he was not of the bloodline of the Jews who took pride in their bloodline of David. There would have been rumblings prior to this nude, possibly, 
with the news because of the shepherds sharing what they had previously seen with the newborn son of Mary and Joseph. And see, the time between the shepherds seeing Jesus and when the wise men would see him would be a significant amount of time in between because the shepherds went to a manger. And as verse 11 tells us, the magi, they went to Christ in a house. It's not like the nativity scenes that sometimes we see. There was a difference between when the shepherds would see him and when the wise men would see him. And so there may have been rumblings. They may have heard things coming from Bethlehem, five miles away from Jerusalem. And if Herod, the man, was willing to put his family members to death, he was already living a troubled life. No peace. No peace for his troubles. And Herod's troubles were so bad that if all of Jerusalem was troubled, as verse 3 tells us, it's because they knew his terror. Why would Jerusalem be troubled? All of Jerusalem, as soon as they heard about the, the, the birth of the king, could they be afraid of the possible terror of Herod, of who he represented and how he handled his affairs and his business? And so it troubled even the children of Israel. And so we see that troubled people, not only do they trouble themselves, but in some cases when they're in leadership, they trouble others as well. And so Herod's trouble was so bad that all of Jerusalem will be troubled with him because everybody know how scandalous this man could be. And his leadership could reflect his personal troubles. That's one place you didn't want to serve. You did not want to serve this king. You see, this news of the birth of the king can be the best news that you have ever heard, or it can be trouble for you if you do not perceive the holiness of God. Was Herod troubled that his throne was threatened, or did he not understand first and foremost that his soul stood condemned? You shouldn't fear, Herod, about your your throne. You should worry about your soul. And the truth is that all men are born in sin, and all persons are born with trouble. As the Bible declares, we're enemies of God. And so this news could have caused him great joy and happiness, but instead, for all the wrong reasons, it brought him trouble. The fact is that all persons not found in Christ should be troubled because all men that know that something is not right in life. They could have all the things of this world, including a throne like Herod, but they won't be able to tell you or put their finger on or point to what's really wrong within their lives. All men stand condemned. Don't be troubled, Herod, over your throne. Be troubled because you're at war with the living God because of your sin. And this news of the newborn king would be able to make peace with God in order to take this trouble away. It makes us think back if you're a believer here. Do you remember what life was like before you heard or understood the gospel. Whatever it was in your life, there was trouble. And nothing could take that trouble away. Nothing could take the guilt. Nothing could take the shame. Nothing could take the confusion away. Yet, this child would go on to do so for us. So when you see the old pictures and you see the things that look great, Always remember that before Christ, there was trouble in your life like Herod. The second thing we see is that Herod saw answers for all the wrong reasons. Verses 4 says this, Gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. 
Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. Herod's troubles led him to inquire answers to what the Magi had asked him from the chief priests and the scribes who confirmed to him what the scripture had said. On a side note, maybe these scribes and chief priests would be the ones 30 years later that would battle Christ. The ones who would battle with him because he would amaze the people because he taught with authority as detailed in scripture. God had an answer for Herod's trouble, but it was not the answer Herod was looking for. That's the beautiful thing about this wonderful gospel, is that yes, we're born and we have trouble. And yes, God gives us an answer for that trouble. It's not going to the doctor and saying, the doctor telling us what it could be. Why don't you try this? This might help. This might do this. This might do that. But when you have a troubled soul, God has an answer for you. And Herod had that truth in front of him. But it's what he did with that truth that's amazing. This is a big deal. This is a huge deal that Herod would receive a truthful answer from the scripture. God does not leave man in his trouble. He's not a God that winds the the clock and then walks away. He has an answer for all of our sin. Imagine if he didn't give us what we needed, what kind of God he would be. If he just left us in our troubles. But instead he has an answer. And that is the scripture. And that is Jesus Christ in this good news. We have a true answer. And you can see throughout the scriptures when men did not have an answer and how God would take care of them. You can ask Pharaoh when he needed help to interpret his dreams. But his magicians and his wise men could not help. You can look to Nebuchadnezzar as he sought help from his magicians, his conjurers, his sorcerers, and his Chaldeans for his dreams. But their answer would be, that thing the king commands is difficult. God would give answers to Pharaoh and to Nebuchadnezzar And also Herod, just like he has an answer for all men, which is Christ. What was the intent of Herod? To run to the truth or to use the truth for his advantage to push his own agenda? We see his motives and what he does with the truth, asking for the exact time of the birth of the Messiah. And Herod shows us that truth can be before you. Yet without a new heart promised through the gospel, you will not see it for its true worth. Only the Lord can cause you to be born again and embrace this wonderful truth. How beautiful the message would be that Herod would receive. I imagine Herod being right there, trying to rule the people. And yet, as the scripture says, a true ruler and a shepherd would come. You would think that this man would give in and say, I can't do it. This is crazy for me. These people don't want me. How can I get in line to compliment what he's about to do? But there was none of that talk. Praise God for his sufficient word that stands, whether it's rejected or accepted. The word stands truth no matter what. It doesn't matter if Herod mocks this word. It doesn't matter if he's looking to use this for his own agenda. What matters is is that the word of God stands forever. One commentator says, he understood not the spiritual nature of the Messiah's kingdom. Let us be aware of a, a dead faith. A man can be persuaded of many truths and yet may hate them because they interfere with his ambition or sinful indulgences. Such a belief will make him uneasy And the more resolved to oppose the truth and the cause of God, he may be foolish enough to hope for success therein. The third thing that we see is we see that Herod was deceiving with this truth. Verses 7 and 8. And then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me 
that I too may come and worship him. He was deceiving. Go and search carefully for the child. In other words, go with diligence, find the exact child the scribes just told me about. I want to go worship. When we think about the deceiving heart of a man or a person found in sin, these are not just average men that Herod is speaking to. The Bible refers to them as wise men. In all the years of ruling, Herod learned how to play the game. Because these wise men, they agreed to do what Herod asked of them in at least going to the child. And it would take a warning from God in a dream for them not to return to Herod. Herod was a liar, which is nothing new to the sinful heart. He would fight the truth going down to the lowest of lowest, lowest of lowest to get what he wanted. Just as the serpent was deceiving to Eve, so Herod would be to these wise men. And as long as sin is a man's master, no man can truly be trusted. This is the hardest thing you will tell your kids, or one of them, I will say, as you try and guide them as they grow. I think Pinocchio gives us an example with Honest John right off the bat, because you worry about your kids. You know that men may look good on the outside, but no man can tell the intent of a man's heart. That's what sin does. It brings corruption to a man. And this is what makes the body of Christ so unique, is that though we are not perfect and though we are in the process of sanctification, this is the one place where man should be able to come in and trust the motives of of God's people. And there are times where we do fail, but at the same time, We are pointing to Christ for his glory, for his honor. We always want to edify the Lord God before us, all right? And that's important, I think, as the church, the challenge goes out to us is, may we live in a way that we can be trusted with the truth so that outsiders come in and say, there's something different about these people. What is it? It's Christ. It's not us. It is Christ. In the the end... A good name, which was his legacy, would go down as a man who had no integrity, which led to he even deceived himself. I know if it was me and I was Herod and I had these motives, the first thing I would say is, yeah, you know where this child is? All right. Let me send my guys with you. Let's take care of this problem right away. But in God's sovereignty, he protected his own son. He deceived himself. Instead of Jesus being put in a place to be threatened by Herod, he would instead make sure that he would be called out of Egypt. God is always involved in all things, and he makes sure that he protects his own, even against deceiving men. The fourth thing we see is that He was very enraged to the point of murder. Even though it wasn't in the text I read, I'll read verse 16. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were born in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which had been determined by the Magi. His deceiving plan fell apart. Like all those who put a plan together to destroy the Lord, their plans never prosper. One commentator says, furious at being deceived, he raged against the Lord and his anointed one. Yet there was no narrow escape. The one enthroned in heaven laughs and scoffs at the Herods of this world. Herod would wait to see these wise men come back to only realize that they weren't coming back for God had the real blueprints. And in his anger, he would calculate a certain time, which ended up being two years and under, and slew all the babies, boys. One of the saddest things we read in Scripture in Bethlehem and its vicinity. Even though Herod the Great accomplished some wonderful achievements, such as major construction during his reign, he is best known for his extreme paranoia 
and the bloodshed that ensued. The story of his slaughter of young boys in and around Bethlehem is consistent with his pattern of his own life. You see, we, we see in Scripture how he sent his son. The Lord God would send his son to Egypt. Again, this birth announcement has a different effect on all men. And this announcement would cause Rachel to weep for her own children. In the end, Herod was five miles from God. And yet the distance of his heart from the child would be too far to even measure. That is the sinful condition that all are born in. Now let's look at the response of the Magi. Who were they? These astrologers pursuing their observations of the stars and the heavens, an encountered sign of God, broke, God broke through their misguided system to make known the great event that took place. Truly, we don't know about these, these magi. There's not much in scripture. You can do some research. All we know is that God opened up their eyes. Praise the Lord for that. And we're going to see how special this is for individuals like us. Tradition says that these men could have been three because there was three gifts that were given to, to the child, but the text does not tell us the exact amount of wise men that would come to visit the Christ. You put yourself in their shoes, no technology, looking at the stars, not moving very much, all of a sudden something happens, no Hubble, we're going. Let's go and inquire where this child is and what we ought to seek. The first thing we see from them is they sought the king. In verse number 10, it reads, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. The Magi's journey was rewarded as they seen the star above the child's home. And there is truth to the malady. Ain't nothing like the real thing. <laughs> this is the real thing. This is what they have been looking for. They were looking for God, and they were about to see him. Brothers and sisters, our journey has us moving towards our God, as Brother DJ said. We're seeking after him. And as we seek after him, we see him in the distance. He's right there. And our prayer is always, come, Lord Jesus. But in the meantime, we can rejoice with great joy, knowing that we have him in his spirit. The spirit of God dwells within us. But we long to look for our king. We long to see him, not in a manger or not as a baby, but as a lion ready to judge this world and love and rule his people with righteousness. We rejoice exceedingly with great joy, knowing the true way to the Lord. I think it's beautiful. It's beautiful to know the truth and know you have nothing to do with it. Even the faith, we stand humbled before the Lord. Even the faith that we have comes from Him. We truly stand naked before Him with nothing. As we journey, we must be reminded of what Peter tells us as the journey takes a toll. Because it does take a toll. It is not, as the TV preachers will tell you, the easiest life you'll live, just come to Jesus. It is a hard toll. It's a hard journey. And Peter reminds us, and though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as an outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Found in 1 Peter 1, 8 through 9. And yet, without true hope, this world tries to manufacture truth. This is the time of year where people see it the most. We just need more Christmas spirit. And they try and manufacture it. You hear words like peace and joy, but that's not true joy. A man coming down a chimney cannot save you. <laughs> right. True joy is knowing that you are coming to the Lord. 
Is this what men are truly looking for? To the believer, yes. To the believer, there's a special thing that happens to us where we don't have to ask the question, what's next? We have exactly what our soul craves, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why some wonder what the big deal about Christmas actually is. They don't get it. They don't see it. Just like Herod. And just like that today, our society tries to manufacture certain things to create this false atmosphere. And yet to the believer, we know the truth. All right? So we must continue to ask God to supply us, just like the Magi, with great joy as we battle and as we journey. The second thing we see is they worshiped. As seekers of the child, their joy led to worship. There was a, a seat for them on the inside. There was no outside gla- ga- gazing or glaring. If I could only see what he looks like. What God allows us to do as redeemed people is we get to worship him. We get to be in his presence. This is a big deal, especially when you read Exodus. And as the children of Israel see Moses talking to God, this is no easy thing. <laughs> you go talk to him. We don't want none of that. And yet now we get to be in his presence. You see, you would think that the scribes and the chief priests would have been first in line at the news the wise men gave. Them two being five miles away and them knowing the scripture. And yet we rejoice because this is a new era where the seed of Abraham will become extended to all nations. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him, according to John 1.11. Now though the seed of Abraham, now through the seed of Abraham, the Gentiles are now coming to worship. We think of reverence that these men had for the child coming. The house, the child would be in lowly, for his parents did not have much but it would be a perfect place for worship. And these men would bow before the child. And what a privilege it is for the believer to be in his presence. And that's what we seek after, and that's what this child allows us to do. You see, he would pay the price for our sins, allowing us to be his children. And his children allowed to worship their God. This is what we were created for. And because of Jesus, we can do it again. When you think about what man will give his worship to, even if it's him staring at himself in the mirror, he will worship something. Romans 1 tells us how far he will go and what he will do to give his worship because that's what he was created for. And yet in this child we find where we can finally lay our worship because we're part of this kingdom. The third thing, they gave gifts, verse 11. The God of this universe allows his children to bless him. Does he need us to bless him? No, he's self-sufficient. Yet he allows us to bring many forms of worship. One commentator says, we do not read that they gave such honor to Herod, though he was in the height of his royal grandeur. But to this babe they gave this honor, not only as to a king, then they would have done this the same for Herod, but as to God. The gifts the wise men presented were gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Providence sent these as a seasonable relief to Joseph and Mary in their present poor condition. Thus, our Heavenly Father, who knows what his children need, uses some as stewards to supply the wants of others and can help provide for them even from the ends of the earth. Whether gold, frankincense, myrrh, or a mite, the people have an opportunity to bless God and look forward to it. And God loves cheerful givers. The fourth thing we see in our last point this morning as they were obedient. Verse 12. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, 
the Magi left for their own country by another way. Adoration of the child would lead to obedience. God would ask of the wise man to go a different way, to go home. When we think about this, this is a tough place to be in a tough pickle. Do I listen to God or do I listen to Herod? He's not just the king of Jerusalem, he's the king of the region. All right, this is a big deal. You got, a, you got outsiders coming in and you got outsiders leaving. Who am I going to be obedient to, Herod? Or am I going to be obedient to the living God? The followers of Christ can be sure that God requires obedience of their lives. And he gives a scripture to make known how we ought to live. And just as God spoke to wise men in a dream, he now speaks to us through scripture. And we have everything we need for scripture is sufficient to give us the instructions to be obedient before our God. See, no follower of Christ has the freedom to live a life free from the obedience that God requires of his people. Because God ordains all things, but not only that, he puts the desire for his children to be obedient to him. And his children love it. We love being obedient to God, for God takes pleasure in our obedience. If you love me, you will obey my commands. In this case, the wise men would only confirm what they were doing because of the privilege that they would have of God speaking to them in their dream. They seen the star, they came, and now God would visit them in their dreams, confirming that it was exactly what they were supposed to be. So in closing this morning, I ask you, what say you? Who is Christ to you? Do you have the view of Herod? Or do you have the view of the wise men? Will you give your life to something that is passing away? Or will you give your life and your honor and your love and your worship to a God whose kingdom where there shall be no end. Like Herod, is Jesus a threat to your own personal kingdom? We live in a society that picks and chooses what we want when it comes to leadership. Hashtag not my president for all the young people. But make no mistake, this isn't a 48 year rule as a president. This is an eternal God who reigns forever. And little kingdoms like Herod's will pass away and will be an afterthought. But the kingdom of this God, this child who would be born, his kingdom would rule forever. Can't pick or choose. Your picking or choosing of him does not do anything to who he is. He is self-sufficient and he will reign. He is inviting you this morning to come to his kingdom. I can tell you this, in all honesty, he's a good God. You want to be in his presence. You will fight and you will lose. You will lose because what God wants, God gets. For we know at the end, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. This humble child has a place for you in his kingdom. Are you troubled? Do you rage? Do you have anger? And there's many other characteristics of sin outside of what Herod did. But I can tell you this, God gives us an answer, and it is the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, he extends his hand to you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in reverence and worship, we come to you this morning and we ask, Lord, that every heart in this auditorium would have surgery done to it, spiritual surgery, Lord, that would cause us to have affections for your son. For we know, Lord, as the scripture says, 
that you loved your son. And may we today love him as well. May we humble our hearts as we bow before him this morning. May we call him our one true savior. We thank you that you would send him. But you did not need to send your son to sinful men. And yet, Lord God, for your own honor and your own glory, for your name's sake, Lord, you fulfilled your promises to your people. So today, Lord, we stand here fortunate. We are blessed to be in this kingdom. We thank you, Lord, that you would protect your child, the God-man, that you would call him from Egypt, that you would make him a Galilean, that you would use him, Lord, he would preach and he would heal. There was not, he proved to us there was nothing impossible for God. We thank you for this God-man who would hang on a tree and become a curse for us, Lord. He took our place. And we thank you, Lord, for the resurrection of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Cause all men and women in here this place to see this wonderful truth on this Christmas afternoon. We sing to you one last song and we exalt your name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.